Welcome to the Sports Stream. I'm Alexander Pascal, and uh, today we'll be talking about AI behavior trees with Daniel Broder. He's a uh, senior gameplay programmer for uh, Fortnite, and he's got some pretty interesting uh, tips and tricks for you. So we'll go ahead and let him take over, and uh, he'll show you uh, show you what's up. Sure. Uh, so uh, I'm trying to uh, go over as many things as we've seen on the forums and, and things as possible. So um, to start with, I'm actually going to talk about uh, a change we made to the decorators. Um, some people have been asking about, we changed, uh, there used to be a receive condition check and a finish condition check, uh, and now there's perform condition check uh, or perform condition check AI. So uh, first of all, the way you get these now is if you go to functions uh, in, well, so once you've created, you create a decorator blueprint, which drives from uh, BT decorator blueprint base. And if you have that, uh, you go to functions and it says overridable and you have a nice drop down and if you decide to override one, it will create it for you. Um, in this case, instead of perform condition check, I've perf used perform condition check AI. Uh, that's just really just a convenience function. Uh, if it can use the AI one, it will. Uh, and otherwise it uses the normal one. So you generally don't want to actually have both. Um, but, uh, but this is basically just convenience because it gives you the controller and the pawn. Um, so, uh, a and that's obviously if there's an AI associated with it, theoretically you can use behavior trees uh, associated with anything. So, um, so this is just a simple BS decorator, just as an example, where I'm like, okay, if my velocity is greater than zero, then uh, then this conditional is okay, and this shows you how to do it now. You don't need um, you. Do there's no longer a finish uh, condition check that you have to add. Now, the reason we've changed this, there's a few reasons. One, one is just that before you had to know that you had to add a finish condition check, uh, and it was sort of magic knowledge that was confusing to people. Now, hopefully, if you just look and, f and once you find them in, in the functions uh, and, and override them, you can just say, oh, this, this is something that I could do, okay. And now you have that and you don't have to worry about the, the end because you have to hook this up. Um, the finish condition check also, because it was just part of the, the general graph, you could end up doing it in some cases, but accidentally not finish in other cases, and then you'd never be finished, and uh, that would obviously cause bugs, so this, this helps with that as well. Um, <coughs> the, uh, the other thing is that uh, since this uh, forces a return value, um, you, you also can't call finish at a bad time in the frame, because before you could have called finish at some totally inappropriate time based on some other event or something, but here it's called when it actually happens. Um, you can still, if for some reason your conditional needs to do things during the frame, you can still do things in the event graph as a whole, in a, in a tick function or whatever else you want on timers. Um, you could even just have this part of the function just return a boolean that's cached somewhere else, but in most cases you don't need to do that and it's probably better not to, so this way you just have your simple function, you do whatever it is. Um, one of the things that uh, some people may be concerned about is they're like, but I already had mine in the old system, and I had you know, splitting executable uh, execution, I had a bunch of different things I had to do to calculate, and then I called finish from three different places, and some of those were true and some were false, and how do I turn that into something where it returns one easily? Isn't that going to be a pain? Uh, well, it's not too much of a pain. Uh, we don't we, we don't yet have this uh, particular macro that I'm about to show you in the engine. We probably should be adding this to our macro library, but uh, it's very easy to write this macro. I'll show you in a second that uh, merges execution. This is basically just unbranch uh, conceptually. It's if you think about uh, branch. The reason I say it's sort of unbranched is this takes a boolean and then splits execution, and this takes execution and puts out which one came in. So the nice thing about that is wherever you maybe had in the past um, one flow that was like, oh, I want to return that I succeeded, and then coming from some other event, I don't actually have something in here, so I'll just 
add a branch just because whatever. Um, but uh, you had some other thing that was saying, hey, I here is where I was going to a finish execution false. Now you can just come into here and just plug this in uh, if you were doing that and bam, you've got your stuff hooked up. Uh, so, so it shouldn't be too much of a problem to um, to do that. Now, what is merge execution? It's actually very simple. Uh, it just uses a local variable and sets it to true or false depending on which one it came in and then outputs it. So you can, this is useful in a lot of cases when you're like, oh, I really just wanted to combine this, but I do need to output that variable for some later use or whatever. Uh, so there's that. Um, just uh, to show the example, when I was saying before that uh, we have perform condition check AI and perform condition check, just uh, to be clear, we have that for a lot of things now. We have AI versions, so this is in a service. We have event receive tick AI and event receive tick. And again, the AI version is just convenience. You can see that this tick thing, I could cast the owner to a controller, which is usually the uh, the way we are running behavior trees right now. Uh, and then I could get my controlled pawn, and I could output that um, to here. But instead, I have this convenience function, and now I can not have <coughs> to do this stuff. Um, yeah, of course, really useful stuff. I mean, this is stuff that um, I was discussing it with Mieszko that we we figured that there were two nodes that almost everyone was using, and that was cast to AI controller, and then immediately get controlled yes. pawn. And so this is just a way of circumventing that by just doing controlled pawn out of the, anything that says AI at the end on these events is going to let you have that option. Yep. And so you guys want to probably use that since if you're doing it, it'll help you streamline a little better. Yeah, absolutely. Sorry, I, I, I may be going too fast. So oh, no, no, I, I just wanted to throw in a little note down there that uh, Mieszko is definitely like super aware of, of your feedback. And, you know, we kept hearing this one. So, you know, let yeah. us know more about it. He loves to hear AI feedback. Cool. Um, so, uh, yeah, <laughs> let me just think for a second. Um, just a, a minor note that I, I just want to point out to people because this is a uh, convenient thing to know about is you can actually now do pure casts. Um, so if you right click on the cast node, you can convert to a pure cast. Uh, and what that means is no execution is needed. Uh, and this tells you whether or not it was successful, which is how that other cast was working. This is sometimes very convenient if, um, in some cases, you don't you don't need to use execution flow. You can just say, "Oh, hey, I want to do a bunch of things." You know, obviously, you can get the execution back by branching uh, off of this success, and then that's basically the same thing. But but sometimes it's nice to just be able to do some selects or other things where you're operating on data uh, by itself. So um, anyway. Uh So, um, let's get on to, I wanted to show a quick example. Some people had been asking about uh, setting up a patrol, uh, patrolling AI. Uh, yeah, it's definitely come in quite a few times. It's like, hey, how do I make my, my guy who patrols point to point, and then ultimately when he sees an enemy, breaks his patrol cycle and charges the enemy. And so, yeah, this is definitely an excellent example of that. Yeah, so, um, so this is... This is really a simple example. I just kind of threw this uh, together last night. Um, but uh, the idea here is uh, the AI is, while the AI is running, it, it runs this service. Services are things that tick uh, every so often. You can specify the interval. So here I've got it set to tick every tenth of a second uh, and just kind of runs in the background. So this behavior tree, he's trying to find an enemy. I've actually added an option in this case to check line of sight. Now, normally, this probably isn't the preferred way to do it. We, we have a whole perception system, uh, and, and it would probably be better to just uh, use that, but... Um, this is pretty simplified. For so a very yeah. simplified version, uh, this is the reason I threw this together is, for, for a simplified version, you can totally do it this way, um, and it, it just depends on, on the game. I, I wanted to keep things uh, a little simpler in this case. So this is just saying, okay, I want to find visible enemies, basically. That's what checking line of sight means. Uh, and if I have an enemy, and basically that will set it into the blackboard. 
And if I have an enemy, then I want to go to the enemy. Um, I, I don't have, right now there's no like attack or anything in this. This is very simple. But uh, if I don't have an enemy, then uh, I want to pick my patrol point, make sure that that's in the blackboard, move to it, and then uh, once I've successfully gotten there, say, hey, I need to increment my next, go to, go to my next patrol location, uh, or you know, set, set the next patrol location, which uh, by, by incrementing the index, basically, I can then set that into the black with the actual location into the blackboard from the index and move the, the you know. So, so I will just keep doing this and keep uh, cycling through my patrol locations. Um, so uh, the way this part works with the patrol locations is basically, first of all, in the uh, character, um, I added a variable uh, that is right here, AI, patrol points. Uh, this is an array of actors um, just as a convenient way to position them in the level, which I'll show you in a second. Um, and so you can just use little dummy actors as like, here are places that I want to uh, path to. Um, and I exposed that. You can see this uh, eye is green. This is whether it's exposed uh, in the blueprint or not. And then uh, the green is actually because I, it would be yellow, but I, I put in a tooltip explaining what it does, um, which is nice because then you mouse over it somewhere. <laughs> and it actually tells you. But uh, anyway, um, so since I exposed that in the uh, actual level in the this character, um, first of all, I placed a bunch of little actors, these little white things here. These are just little patrol location actors. They're basically just just actors with no particular special properties, just, just so I can get a location, which is a fairly heavy way to create locations, but again, it, it's fine for, for a lot of cases. If you're really worried about performance, you're probably um, doing something m uh, more complex and, and you can roll a more complex solution. So, um, so I placed these actors and I placed them. I wanted the AI to start in this lower left corner and run a column and then go over and then come back down and sort of zigzag his way back and forth vertically through uh, through this looking for people. And then when he gets back to the bottom right corner, he'll come all the way across to the left corner again. So, uh, so I placed all these locations. Um, and then in the actor himself, I exposed this under AI, patrol points. So I just added all of the elements, and then I used the eyedropper, and I was like, OK, let me pick these actors. And I just picked all the actors in the order that I wanted him to visit the patrol locations. When he gets to the last location in the list, he'll go back to the zeroth one from there. Um, so uh, this is an enemy here. I'm going to move him to where he cannot be seen, hopefully. Hopefully that will work. And we'll see him do his patrol for a second. And then we'll look at the behavior tree and and see how this is being done. Um, so he's zigzagging, uh, like I said. Um, and this is all. Uh, all done fairly simply. Um, so now if I, oops, I lost the enemy. <laughs> um, so you can hit stop. I'll I can. I, I'll actually just run it again in a second okay. um, rather than trying to find him under this geometry. We can see he just completed the whole uh, thing. He's back in the bottom corner and then he'll go up to the top. So, so that's good. Now I'm going to, oops, wrong one. Well, that actually shouldn't matter. Uh, in theory, that should still work. But you know what? Just because I'm going to put this back this way and run this. And oh he yeah. sees the guy. He started heading to it, and he immediately sees him. So yes. And he goes there. And if I move this guy over here, he lost sight of him. And in this simple version, he has no memory of him. So he doesn't. he just goes, OK, I need to go back to my next patrol point and then if I like peek out 
in front of him he goes, oh, there you are. And then, oh, he saw me, so I have to hide better. Now he goes back to his patrol point where he left off uh, and all that. So how is this working? Um, actually, I'm going to let it keep running for a second, and I'm going to look at the behavior tree, which is here. So oh, right now, found the enemy. <laughs> right now he has the enemy, and in fact he's there. So the reason it's blinking is he keeps succeeding. If we pause this, you can see I step back. He's like, I'm already there. Oh, what should I do? Move to him. Well, I'm already there, so he yeah. just keeps doing that. Um, but let me just uh, one second. I'm going to just real quick hide the enemy so that he cannot find him. Oh, Hopefully. he can't put him physically into the wall there? Uh, nope. Yeah, actually, the funny thing about this with simulation is that uh, if I do it fast enough, I can do it. <laughs> but <laughs> <laughs> Trying to trick the I collision, think. are we? Yes, I'm, I'm pretty sure. There we go. I think that's working now. Um, uh, yeah, now he moves through them that properly. That that's partly because... Uh, to be clear, that's because the moving the thing while you're simulating is sort of cheating. That's not how th <laughs> that's not how the physics works when you're running the game normally. So no, they can't of course they not. can't normally just be embedded in the wall by just running fast. But uh, yeah, so we we literally cheated way we for can. that. So yeah, so right now he's now patrolling, and you saw it blink for a second because he got to a patrol location and then he incremented. So we can see this by yeah. pausing it and stepping back. I really love see. this system of being able to debug step by step through the AI. And you can see, yeah, where it failed here and all that. It's really yeah. great. Yeah, it's really nice. So we say, nope, I do not have an enemy. Uh, so I uh, will do this. You, you may wonder, some of you may wonder, well, if I don't have an enemy there, why am I checking that I have no enemy here? And the reason is that this could have failed for some other reason. Mo move to enemy could have failed because uh, maybe the enemy is in a place that's unreachable. Uh, and we don't, and maybe that means that this is actually wrong, right? I mean, maybe your behavior should be, hey, if I didn't get to him, now I want to go to a patrol location. But uh, for this example, I didn't want to do that. I wanted to, like, get as close as I could to him, even if it failed, and then just keep trying to get to him as long as I knew where he was and not go back on patrol. So um, since this could have failed for that reason, we actually do have to check again and say, oh, wait, do I not have an enemy? Then I want to patrol. Um, so, uh, yeah, so we can step through this and see that it succeeded at setting the location. Then it moved. Oh, I didn't back up far enough to see a full cycle. So, yeah, it succeeded. It succeeded in moving. It incremented. Then it came back around and, and started that cycle again. Um, so first off, we'll look at the service uh, real quick. Um, this is the service I was showing earlier where I actually replaced uh, what used to be a receive tick with receive tick AI because it's more convenient. And then you, you need to get rid of that whole thing. Done. Get rid of those. Oh, you're, you're still simulating. You oh, I'm still simulating, so I can't actually delete them. alter things uh, while playing. Yes. So. <laughs> Thank you for pointing that out. I otherwise, I would have been like, wait, why isn't it deleting? Yeah. Um, so all this is doing is basically saying uh, let's... Uh, using a local variable, have I found it yet or not? Get all uh, pawn actors, uh, loop through those, and uh, try casting them to uh, my special blueprint in this case uh, that I made for this character, BPAI character. Um, and if that succeeds, then check if it's an enemy by comparing uh, the team ID. Uh, I'm not, I'm not going to get too much into the details of this. I'm going to try to just say, okay, if it's an enemy, then if I wanted to check line of sight, uh, since I added that checkbox that we saw, and again, the reason that was visible as a checkbox in the behavior tree is because I exposed it here uh, using uh, this eye thing. This says, hey, this should be exposed to be edited from somewhere. So uh, in the behavior tree, I checked this option here check line of sight, um, which I had exposed. So I just added this variable and exposed it. Um, if we're checking line of sight, I do a line trace by channel uh, against visibility. And if I did not hit anything, then hey, I can set this enemy into the blackboard. 
Uh, or if I didn't care about line of sight, I just go ahead and set him into the blackboard. And then once I do that, uh, I'm calling on visible enemy found. The, the reason I added this event was just to avoid uh, the sort of horror of, a, of an execution thing. I'm going to stop this for a second. Uh, I, I really don't like uh, when execution loops back around. It's, it's really horrible to look at when you're like, oh, wait, this is going to what over here? So instead of having to do that, I just added an event. I call that event. And so this is the custom event that's used to trigger your break. It's just here to trigger the break, yeah. So, hey, I found an a visible enemy. I don't need to keep looking through all the possible pawns for a visible enemy. Um, technically, this is maybe misnamed because whether he's visible or not depends on uh, <laughs> whether that uh, option for whether I want to check line of sight is checked. But on enemy found, I guess I could have called it. Um, yeah. and, and for those of you that are watching, if this is a little bit, like I know it's a lot of blueprints all at once, I'm going to get screenshots of this and make sure that we put them up on the forums so that you can like sit down and do it at your own pace. But we're going to kind of um, just talk about it kind of quick if it's a little fast for you. Don't worry. Yeah, sorry, <laughs> sorry about that. I'm. Uh, no, we have a lot to cover today. I, I've, <laughs> I've, I've, d I've definitely going through this really fast. Sorry, sorry about that. So, uh, and then when the loop completes, which happens whether I broke it or not, right? Either I go through the entire thing or I break. But when I'm done with it, uh, I, I, I had set a ver value over here. Uh, I set that I found it locally. That was just so I could know when I'm done with the loop, hey, did I actually find something or not? Because if I don't, uh, I actually want to clear out the enemy. Because otherwise, uh, when I'm looking for a visible enemy, I see him, and I set it, and then I don't see it again. But if I don't clear it, then the, the old enemy stays there uh, indefinitely. So, um, so this way, it's really nice that um, you know it, it gets cleared out properly. <laughs> uh, so that's fairly... Uh, simple, I think, <coughs> actually. Um, uh, obviously, some of the details, it looks kind of complicated, but, but hopefully y you can sort of break it down and, and understand each of the, uh, each of the parts uh, if, you, if you need to look through this once, once the screenshots are up and everything. Um, so that's what the service was doing. So now it knows whether it has an enemy or not. So then the question is, how did I pick those patrol points? You saw that I set them in the mm -hmm. array on the character. Um, so how does that location end up in here? So the, the way it works is, uh, at the moment, we just had an entry in the Blackboard called interest location, which I'm using for the patrol location. Uh, I've, I was doing this from a, a sample that was made without patrolling, and so I didn't, I didn't feel like renaming uh, <laughs> all of those things. But basically, I'm, I'm the interest location is the patrol location. So... Um, so set patrol location, uh, all that does is uh, when that executes, it calls a function on the controlled pawn, uh, which is th that AI that's running around doing his patrol. Uh, and it's actually calling a, an interface function. Uh, I don't know how many of you used interfaces. I'll, I'll show you that in a second. Um, but this, this allows it to call a function that, that even if you had different pawn blueprints, any number of them could implement this function. Uh, so this gets the current patrol location. It returns uh, the actual location uh, as a vector and whether it found one or not, uh, just in case that was possible to fail. Uh, so if, uh, if it found it, then it sets that location into the blackboard, uh, and otherwise it clears that entry from the blackboard so we don't accidentally use it. And then regardless, uh, it returns, and here it's saying, did I succeed or not? Well. It depends on whether I found a location. If I did, then I succeeded, and otherwise I didn't. Um, just a note uh, for those of you who maybe haven't seen these much yet, um, these are really convenient for keeping graphs nice and um, you know, relatively non-overlapping and, and readable. Uh, these are called uh, redirectors. So when you pull off of any type of node, or excuse me, reroute nodes, you can say add reroute node. And you can use that to help you uh, not have lines going behind other things and crisscrossing each other in ways that are uh, terribly hard to read. Um, 
so this interface function, what is that? Because how did I get that location? Uh, so uh, when I double click that, it takes me to the interface class. Um, in this case, I called it iPatrol. Uh, I like to use i as a prefix for interface, and then it makes these nice sentences often, which amuse me. Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> I interface with <laughs> what's his face. Yeah, yes, yeah. yes. Um, so my, my favorite one that I ever made was I self destruct. Um, <laughs> but uh, I, I self destruct. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I, I have a few um, that are like um, live and eat. Now I'm going to change those to I live and I <laughs> eat. Yes. Because that's going to make, make it nice. Yeah, I like that. <laughs> anyway, um, it, it's, it's nice to have I for, for interface, but it, it happens in this case that because <laughs> it's a verb, it, it works as a sentence. Um, the anyway, so I created this by, how did I create this class? Uh, it's right here. Uh, if you right click, <coughs> you can go to uh, create blueprint interface, and that creates that. When you create the interface class, um, you can add any number of functions you want here. Uh, you just add a new one, and then all you do is set, basically, you can, you can give them a description for tooltips. You can give them a category. That, that's for when you go looking for them uh, you know, in the sorted context menu. Uh, and then you just set input and output uh, parameters. Um, because these are functions, they always have an execution input and output, um, and you can't have more. Uh, one of the differences between functions and macros, you you can only ha you have exactly one execution wire. You you can't have uh, multiple execution outputs. And we are super aware of the feature request to have more than one uh, execution output. Trust me, we're working on it. It's it's out there <laughs> for functions. Yeah. That shouldn't they they have requested it many times, and uh, uh, we've got some people trying to do something for it. So I'll see how it works well, that's out. I really that's <laughs> very interesting because <laughs> in in programming, in a general sense, the it meaning of function would make that not make sense. But yeah, I guess yeah. we could. We're trying to we come up with a solution for it. That yeah. Um, but yes, the whole point of of a function is is generally that. But but anyway, yes, I I can see that being convenient in some cases. Um, you can always make a macro to wrap the thing. Uh, if uh, you really I've tried that. suggesting macros before. They uh. will cut your head off for that. Careful. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can have a macro that calls a function. So mm. your if your function, for instance, returned whether like it succeeded or something and you wanted two different execution outputs, you can make a macro that branches on the result of the function and just outputs two different executions. That makes and sense. And in a case like that, that might be a simple thing to do. And then you just call the macro. And yeah, it's a macro, which is... Uh, there are some reasons that, that those aren't as good as functions, but the nice thing is you'd still have the function, so your breakpoints in the function would still work, and all that debugging would work nicely. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. You hear that? Feature request canceled. No, I'm just kidding, <laughs> guys. I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, <laughs> anyway, uh, yeah, we, we really, I don't, I don't know, I, I don't think we have a thing out there about explaining all the differences between a function and a macro and collapsed graphs and stuff, but we should probably do that at some point. Yeah, get it nice um, and clarified. But anyway, <coughs> uh, so you make your functions and you can add whatever inputs and outputs for data that you want. Um, and then in your pawn or whatever type other blueprint you have, uh, if you go to class defaults, no, class settings, my bad. Uh, class settings, it shows you which interfaces you've inter you've inter uh, implemented, bleh, and you can just add any other interfaces you would like to implement. Um, this is just basically making a promise that you will implement this. So you really should implement the functions that, that are in the interface. <laughs> but technically, if you don't implement one, uh, then when it's called, it'll just fail, uh, I think. So um, I mean, in a way that doesn't crash or whatever. But, but you may not uh, obviously get the results that, that you think if, if you haven't implemented some, some function. So uh, so I added that, and uh, so now we get to, OK, how do we do things like increment the uh, which patrol point I'm on? So I had that array that had 12 entries in it, 0 to 11. And so I have this local variable in my pawn. This is in the character blueprint. Uh, and this variable is initially 0. 
So whenever you call the interface function to increment that, it just adds one. Uh, this is modulus, which is, uh, for those of you who don't know modulus uh, math, it's basically um, you uh, divide by a value and uh, you uh, basically it lets you it lets you loop. So like it, since in this case we're taking the length, which is twelve things, the the answer out of this will be zero through eleven because you basically you take the remainder. So. This is like saying divide, but throw out the actual division result and just use the remainder. So 0 to 11 divided into 12, the remainder is 0 to 11. And then when you get to uh, 12, 12 divided by 12 is 1 with a remainder of 0. So it wraps nicely. So this, this lets you iterate around uh, circularly as long as you want. And so this just iterates and sets it. Um, so that, that allows us to say, okay, go to the next patrol location. That was, to remind you here, that was actually here. Once I've moved to a location, I increment to the next one. Uh, and this function is says set the control location into the blackboard. This is perhaps not the most elegant way to do this, but, um, you know, it's fairly simple. The, uh, this is what called this interface function that led me into saying, hey, where do interfaces work? So... The question is, this, this gets set into the Blackboard, like I said before, where is that implemented? That is in the character. Sorry, it's here. Uh, I actually thought I was going to do something more complicated, so I actually <laughs> called a function. This is unnecessary now because this function is basically has the same outputs as the other thing. That's a little redundant, but here's basically what it does. Um, it... Uh, this, this would actually be a lot simpler, but I, I've got a lot of error handling in here. So basically what it is, is it says, okay, look in the array at the current patrol index that we just saw when, when we were looking at how to increment it, uh, get that actor, get the location from that actor, and return that. Um, so that's, that's basically this simple part right here is, okay, just return that. The reason there's a whole bunch of uh, extra stuff here... Um, and now I'm looking at this and going, what was I doing there? Why is that dangling? Uh, so I'll have to look at that. <laughs> but anyway, um, the basic thing is that because it's an array of actors, in theory, what if you, instead of using dummy actors, you made those actors physical things like vases or something. Now one of those vases gets destroyed, the actor is gone, uh, the entry in the array is now null. So when he increments to that one, he's going to go, oh, I'm trying to go to something, but it doesn't exist. So I have to be able to fail and then go ahead and increment to the next one. So that's what this is doing is basically it says, okay, uh, I'm trying to get this location. Let me um, try that. And if the thing is not null, then I'm good. The actor existed. I'll just return its location. But if it wasn't, then uh, I need to... Um, Somewhere, I feel like this broke. This <laughs> I swear I had a for loop in here, but anyway, uh, what's supposed to be happening is that if it fails, it should um, increment through them uh, in, a, in a for loop, basically, and just keep trying until it finds one that succeeds, and then it should be coming out here. So it looks like somehow in all of this, I, I broke this particular one. We'll, we'll get a fixed version of this to put up yeah, on we'll the forum. We'll make sure that this one has a screenshot, um, too. All of these that we can, we'll make sure we get yeah, updated so screenshots for. Yeah, so I'm not sure how I did that, but basically, the only reason this isn't just, hey, get the thing in the, in the array and then get its location and return that is, okay, well, what if it's gone for some reason? I should need to keep looking. Um, yep. So I think that's actually pretty much the whole thing for yep. what I've done. Um, here, I'll be getting to some other questions in a second. Because um, that, that set the location, then I moved, and then I incremented. And it's really so quite simple. Controls. That's really impressive how um, simple that is, but it really, you know, you got exactly what you needed out of it. And yeah. really, game AI doesn't need to be um, extremely complex. It needs to be what you need it to achieve. Yeah. You know, that's what a lot of people come in and they go, oh, I want these very advanced kind of AIs. And then at the end of the day, they realize that it's not really what they wanted for their game. Yeah. 
But yeah, it's it's really cool, and I love the power of behavior trees, and that you can accomplish so much with just a few nodes, really. Yeah, and uh, just to touch on like the idea of how much power, also using an interface function, you could add to the behavior tree uh, a thing to say like, well, okay, maybe when when I'm done looking for an enemy because I've dealt with him or I've lost him or something, instead of going back to the last patrol thing, which maybe I want to go to, I want to find the closest patrol location. You can just add another function. And then uh, you can, uh, oh, I think I was, that's why I was looking at the wrong one. The get current one. Oh, no. Hmm. Anyway, I'll have to look through it. But, yes, one of these, you, you can find the one that's closest to you currently and set that as your current index and then be like, okay, uh, I'll go to the closest one and resume my patrol from there instead of resuming from where I left off. Mm -hmm. So you can do things like that fairly simply, too. Um, the other thing I wanted to point out here actually dovetails into the first uh, of some of the questions that were posted uh, is, okay, so that explains how he does the patrol, but why is it that he suddenly broke off the patrol and started moving to the enemy? If he was in the middle of this move to, what made this happen over here? Um, and the answer is this is what observer aborting uh, is. The in that uh, Mike Purvis was actually asking about this. Um, and, and it's an excellent question because this is a, a very important uh, aspect of our behavior trees. Our behavior trees are event-driven, which is is meant to basically uh, allow them to respond to events uh, very real time, and yet uh, not uh, not have to pay a lot of uh, work and performance into like, do I have to check this and check and oh wait, has it changed yet? So uh, for Blackboard uh, decorators, for example, that's automatic. If a, if a Blackboard entry is changed, we can throw an event that will, that will let the behavior tree know. And so in this case, um, this uh, entry in the behavior tree, this has enemy, is set to abort both. It technically could be, in this particular case, set to just lower priority. Um, and let me explain why that is and what this means. So. Um, aborting lower priority, you can see here that th these nodes are surrounded in, in this uh, sort of pale blue, and it shows over here uh, these are nodes aborted by lower mode pro lower priority. These show up when you click o on a particular decorator, they're showing you f relative to that decorator. So if I choose both on this, it's going to also show me lower priority is this lo pale blue, self is this greenish color. Um, so if I abort self, it would be these, and th all of these can be aborted as lower priority. So basically, priority in a behavior tree goes left to right. Left is higher priority. That's the thing I want to do the most. And so what this is saying when it says, hey, I want to abort lower priority, is it's saying, fine, if I fail, like if I have the enemy, wh when I first start in here, I'm like, oh, if I have an enemy, I'm going to do this. But if I don't have an enemy and I start doing something lower priority, whatever that is over here, I want to abort that thing immediately and just start doing this as soon as I can. So as soon as I have an enemy, I want to move to that enemy. And so that, hopefully that <laughs> explains that, uh, what that part means. The aborting self uh, is, I in this case, doesn't matter because what abort self means is I, I w I'm going to quit out of this tree if I no longer have an enemy in this case, right? If, if my conditional ever becomes false, I need to quit. Well, in this case, an aborting is basically equivalent to a failure, so it would fail up here. But if I don't have an enemy, as soon as I don't have an enemy, the move to enemy is going to fail. So whether I'm aborting self or not in this case doesn't matter. Um, and uh, aborting both is, of course, just abort self and also abort lower priority. So, so then the only other thing to really explain is, okay, what is a situation where you want to abort self? Um, so self, in this case, is just a task, but it can include the entire subtree from wherever your, uh, from wherever that node is. And, uh, so, for example, l let's say you're doing a sequence of things, but the thing in the middle maybe wouldn't necessarily fail on its own. So something in that sequence wouldn't fail on its own uh, just because one part of the sequence is going to fail later. So, like, 
you're in a room and, and uh, the, the AI wants to uh, knock out the power by attacking a generator. Uh, but if there's no power, then obviously it shouldn't be attacking the generator. So, uh, so that's its highest priority thing, only if there's power. But, but, but you can lose power without the while the generator still exists. So if the sequence is, okay, move to generator and then attack it, I could be in the process of moving to the generator. The power goes out for some other reason. Now I, there's no point in moving to the generator. I don't need to destroy it anymore. So I can abort that sequence as soon as the power is out and be like, oh, okay, what lower priority thing do I need to do instead? Um, so hopefully that explains that question. Uh, <laughs> now let's see. We've got about... 20 minutes before we have to wrap it up and let Chance take over. So okay. um, we have quite a few questions from the forums. We're going to want to yes, go I over do. those and uh, see what you all have to ask. So why don't you go on ahead and... Okay, I will try to, to go through these quickly because, wow, time flies. Um, uh, sorry, let me... Just looking at my notes for a second, trying to figure out where, where, where I am exactly. Okay, um, so... Uh, D. Zelligman asked mm -hmm. about uh, the differences between instanced and non-instanced behavior tree nodes. Um, so uh, the first point is, if you're using uh, blueprint nodes and you're not writing code, you don't have to worry about that at all. All blueprint mm -hmm. nodes are now instanced uh, because basically, if they weren't, it would be really complicated to have to deal with and figure out wait, what am I doing, and should I set this to be instanced or not, and if I, it's not instanced, what special functions do I have to call? And we used to have all of that, and there were uh, notes and things on the forums about, oh, you have to call this thing, and uh, it, anyway, it was kind of terrible from a complexity standpoint, <laughs> and very easy to screw yourself up, where uh, you had multiple AI, and they were screwing each other up because they, it wasn't instanced. So you don't have to worry about it if you're, if you're not writing code. Um, in code, you can still set whether a node is instanced or not. To explain briefly what that means, uh, instance nodes ha basically means that they have separate copies for the node for every running behavior tree instance. So if it's not instanced, it means that uh, it doesn't have separate memory for different AI, basically, that are running it. So if it, if it has to cache any information, like store, you know, store information about something about the AI, the problem is that if several AI are running, which one of those is stored, and you may be interfering with each other. Um, so for some things, you're just maybe asking like, oh, hey, what's the speed of the current AI, and I don't have to cache anything, and that doesn't need to be instanced uh, in code, for example. But uh, for something else, if you are doing work over time, uh, then it's more complex, and you, you need to be instanced potentially if you're, if you're caching that data. Um, uh, let's see, so generally non-instance nodes are, are more efficient, but they can only act on data that's stored in either the associated Blackboard, because the Blackboard's instance, the pawn is obviously instance, you have separate pawns in the world. Um, so if you're just acting on data that's in those things and not stored in your own, blue in your own code, uh, then you need to be then, then you can be not instanced, but if you have your own code variables that you're storing things about the pawn, then you need to be instanced. Um, uh, so the two uh, main functions or properties related to that are in, for coders, are in UBT node. Uh, there's has instance, uh, which refers to the variable be create node instance. Um, and that basically means this should create an instance when it gets initialized. Um, is instanced will automatically get set once the instance is created. Um, so uh, theoretically, you can decide dynamically <laughs> whether to instance a node, uh, and you can use force instancing to force a node. That's another function in that uh, that doesn't normally instance, but most of the time you probably don't need to do that. You know whether or not it needs to be instanced ahead of time, and you can't force instancing once the tree's initialized. You'd have to do it uh, beforehand. So. Uh, it'd be a pretty specialized case. Um, and uh, uh, given the time especially, I think I'm not going to get into the details of exactly uh, how the memory stuff works, but um, 
there's basically a, a buffer that stores the the instance memory and stuff. We we can maybe post some information about <coughs> it uh, on the forums. Yeah, we'll uh, um, we'll hit up Mieszko and see what what all he yeah. can add on to the forum. But, but for people who aren't coding, the good news is don't worry about it. Everything's instanced, which is good. It's easy. Yeah. This um, doesn't affect you if you're working a lot in BPs yes, so much. Exactly. Um, and and all that complicated stuff that we had before in blueprints, you can forget about. Um, uh, and Dzelman had a bunch of good uh, questions. Actually, he said, uh, "Could you go over uh, UE4's version of special moves that Epic is using for Fortnite?" Uh, actually, we're not using special moves anymore, and we're not even hmm. uh, uh, using something that's really all that analogous to them anymore. Um, we were until recently, but uh, we've just finished converting to a new ability system. Uh, oh yeah, is, which it, is that the one Mieszko's been working on? Or uh, Mieszko didn't make the ability system. This is a actually the ability system is a um, is not AI specific. It's any you know, player characters have abilities. Gadgets, weapons could all have abilities. So uh, the the ability system is uh, a general thing. I, I don't have time. Like we could easily do a whole show about that. That is coming to the engine. That is an engine feature. I'm actually not sure. It mm. might be. I, I'm not sure what the status of it is or what when, when it's coming in terms of the what engine version or whatever. But uh, sounds very useful though. So. But we're using abilities and abilities are different from special moves in a lot of ways. I mean, they're way more powerful. They do a lot more. Um, special moves... <laughs> spe special did moves did could only... one of the viewers that yeah. it was driving him crazy with his OCD. Sorry, oh, go, go on, sir. <laughs> special moves are... Um, are... were a sort of special thing where, like, they... they you can only have one active at a time, and abilities, that's not the case. So they're they're a lot less limited in what they can do. Um, so we'll have to talk about those more sometime. Um, and then he asked, uh, are there plans to pass Blackboard values as data provider parameters to EQS queries via the run EQS behavior task? And the answer is yes. Uh, that's in the pipeline now. Uh, uh, we'll probably be adding some other data providers as well. Uh, I, don't, I don't know the details of what all of them will be, but obviously that will be a very useful one. There might be some abilities related ones. I'm not sure yet. Um, but basically, we now have the ability to pass into, sorry, EQS is the environment query system, uh, to pass into those queries, which are another data asset from the behavior tree. Um, there's already, or, or from wherever they're called from, there, there are now data providers. There's a, a general system for that, and so you can write your own code classes, or we'll be providing more ways to feed data into them through the behavior tree or from whatever other sources. Um, so that that way you can say, oh, I want this same query, but with a different radius for this different AI or things like that. That's that's the point of doing that. Um, and uh, what's the best practice for handling networked AI actions tasks? Uh, so uh, the answer is generally the AI itself just runs on the server, whether it's a dedicated server or just whoever's hosting usually. But um, so. Uh, the behavior tree and navigation and stuff like that should is generally only running on the server. Uh, that should just work, and you don't have to worry about that. Um, and then the way everything else is synced is movement, uh, for example, is synced automatically by <laughs> Unreal, so uh, you don't have to worry about that. And then uh, animation is generally driven not directly from the behavior tree at all, but uh, from... Uh, Thing, other things that are synced, I other replicated properties on the character, uh, or sometimes uh, through other things. But basically, in the uh, animation blueprint, it can drive things based on the speed that the character is going and whatever. So, or based on like, hey, am I crouched or not? If that's a replicated property, you can have things like that. Sorry, trying to to go through this quickly. So, so that's how the animation stuff would work. Um, in Fortnite, we have some special stuff to not run all of the animation on the server uh, because we have dedicated servers and performance is really critical for that. Um, but most of the time you shouldn't need to worry about that. And they'll be going over more about replication in uh, the next stream too. Okay. So if, you're, if yeah. you guys are still interested in seeing more about multiplayer, there will be doing a multiplayer cool. shootout uh, stream next. Cool.
So let me see if I can actually get through all these oh as man. quickly as I can. He's got them back to front, so uh, I do. won't be able to get every may, single question. May not be able to get to all of these. He has them written down, so I'll see if we can't get those up yeah. on the forums. Yeah. Cool, thanks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, what's Epic's typical workflow for managing multiple different templates for similar AI? Uh, the answer is for Fortnite, at least. Uh, I don't know if we have a typical workflow overall, but for Fortnite, we have one code class for AI characters and one code class for AI controllers. The character class allows you to specify a behavior tree, and when the AI controller class possesses that pawn, it runs the behavior tree specified by the pawn. Uh, that lets us specify that data totally, uh, totally in data without having to create new code classes constantly. Um, most of our pawns share the same behavior trees uh, because you can do a lot of things to simplify them, and even if they don't do exactly the same thing, uh, with the ability system, for instance, you can say, hey, do my primary melee attack, whatever that is. Um, so we have four or five behavior trees. Totally different types of pawns have uh, different ones. So in Fortnite, like, melee-only husks are one tree, ranged husks are another tree, uh, smashers, which are these uh, big monsters, are another tree. Um, but... Uh, it's still relatively little as far as that goes. And then we also have uh, a special goal selection thing which uses the environmental query system a lot. And the way we generalize that is that the pawns, again, can specify their own query for like, how do I pick whether to go after the player or a wall or whatever. And uh, that query is specified on the pawn. And again, a lot of that's shared. Um, but that that is something we do specifically just to pick our goal before we, you know, separately from running the behavior tree. Uh, okay, moving on. Can we get an updated roadmap? Oh, this is a good one to hit. Mm -hmm. uh, on character AI systems in development and overall AI systems. Uh, so everything's in constant development. Uh, uh, as much as we can do it, we have, a, uh, you know, actually not that many people, but we're, we're doing a lot of things. Um, you guys are very dedicated. So uh, systems we already have, I guess, to try to, they're like, well, what's the list of systems? Behavior trees, blackboards, obviously. Uh, we have navigation, which uh, is really sort of <coughs> three, at least three subsystems, depending on how you explain it. There's the navigation mesh generation, path generation, and path following. Um, from my perspective on Fortnite, that stuff's all pretty awesome now. Uh, we have pretty complex requirements. We've got dynamic worlds, and you know, AI have to understand which walls are stronger and weaker, and destroy the right ones, and <laughs> that's all working well. Most simple games, uh, I think navigation should be pretty solid now. Um, open world support for navigation. Uh, oh there's yeah. there's some in that will be part of 4.8. A lot of people have been asking about 4.8 and how uh, how that's going to be working with it. So yeah, so I, cool. I, I don't I don't know all the details and I don't have time anyway, but there's, <laughs> there's yeah. open world support coming in that. And then uh, further down the list, uh, I don't know when these will be happening exactly, but uh, is uh, better nav mesh... Uh, uh, streaming support, and navigation on moving platforms. Um, the perception system exists, and there's still some blueprint uh, API work pending in that. Uh, I think also we may be changing at some point uh, how hearing works, because there's some things that some of us aren't, aren't happy about, aren't as happy about as we could be with that. Um, uh, pawn actions. Uh, are an experimental system. Uh, their whole purpose is to have a single way that actions are initiated, whether it's from a behavior tree or just reacting to a stun randomly, <coughs> which probably isn't in a behavior tree, or uh, whatever other types of things. Uh, and then that way they can interrupt each other and abort and things in a, in a consistent way. But that's, that's still experimental right now. Um, and uh, the environmental query system, which I talked about a little bit here without going into. Uh, we we'll have <laughs> another day where we just really deep dive on EQS, I think, because yeah. that's a whole, whole yeah. system. That's still also in the experimental section right now. We still have a lot more improvements we want to make to that. Mm -hmm. Experiment with it. Have fun. Give us feedback. So, yeah. um, uh, And then hotspots. Um, the plan is to make that a, an engine feature. Uh, it's a generic framework for coordinating AI behavior in certain locations. Is that the kind um, of um, stay away from this general area kind of gives no, them a well in in map of what it is? No, or? no, this is sort of different. This is actually in, in Fortnite, for example, to explain 
one use of them. We use it to have the AI spread out across a wall. So like when they come in to attack a wall, you have the problem that like, oh, if one guy gets there and the other guy happens to come in right behind him, yeah. he, uh, he needs to not like get stuck. Up. So this way they actually like fit into sort of slots or something. Uh, you can have hotspots without slots. But in, the, in, in our example case, it's like, oh, hey, they can spread out on the wall. We actually can have ranged guys stop further back and say, okay, hey, I'm in a good place to, to attack the wall. Uh, from a distance. It also means that if we have something uh, that isn't sort of normally shaped, like they're like, oh, I actually want to attack this archway, they know that like, oh, here's where the pillar is, I need to come in this way mm -hmm. and attack it. Instead of kind of like standing in that empty spot and attacking the empty, because right. that's like the center of it. Yes. So yeah, that I could see how the AI could get confused on yeah. that. That's so a really cool little system. Yeah, so uh, that's a specific example. The The hotspot thing in a more general sense is just to be able to say, hey, activate this area thing, like when an AI gets there, so that other AI coming in can go, hey, this AI is doing something, and I, I need to coordinate with him for that, basically. So uh, I'm not sure of all the details there, but uh, Mieszko is the person to ask about, but that we are planning on getting that. Mieszko told me that he'd also like to eventually, once we have hotspots working, implement a simple cover system, but that's not going to happen for a while. Uh, he's saying maybe six months or more. Oh, yeah. um, so it's, it's a ways off, but, but it is in, it's somewhere in the pipeline Just to say somewhere. these things are in the pipeline, we do want to do some of that stuff. Yeah, cover uh, systems have been brought up a couple times. Yeah, and the last thing that's important to mention that we're working on is uh, that because of the fact that we have so many things going on, uh, we really need to make sure that everything stays stable so we don't break things for you. <laughs> uh, so Mieszko has been working on um, uh, improving our stability by adding more functional testing and unit tests. That basically means we can have these things that run that tell us if at any time anything that we're doing breaks anything that we've already got working so that hopefully we won't be introducing new bugs in um, in future builds it's and... Like Precognitive debugger. <laughs> yeah. That's yeah. pretty cool. So, so hopefully we'll be able to keep everything stable and not, uh, you know, not cause any problems. And so thanks, Mieszko. For that, among the many things that, that you're doing. Um, All right, we have about three so minutes left, so. Okay. <laughs> you're doing good, you're doing good. It looks like you have should just I a couple questions left. Let's yeah, um, should yeah, I let's try to hit one of those? Yeah, let's try to hit the two more, and then we'll probably okay. call it. Excellent. Uh, so uh, Dennis Summers, I guess, uh, asked if there's any easy way to create decorators uh, where the condition is checked every frame uh, in C++. Uh, and the answer is yes. In fact, if if you're writing in C++, all you have to do is set be notify tick to true in the decorator's constructor, and then implement the tick function. And you can that's pretty easy. Cool. You can totally do what you want. Nice. Um, uh, and then he also asked, uh, what would be the best way to guarantee our C++ code that a certain Blackboard asset has a certain key, which may or may not have a value correctly set. Um, so. We actually haven't found that we need to guarantee that, um, which uh, basically our code handles failures pretty well. Uh, for most variable types, at least, uh, I'm not sure if it's all of them, but most, we have the concept of like, is the variable set? So even for like vectors, you can say, is that vector set or not? And generally, if the thing doesn't exist in the Blackboard, it's just considered not set. So everything <coughs> works nicely anyway. And so mostly we're just like, okay, yeah, we'll just presume it's there. Uh, the code, if it's setting things, just tries to set them. If it's not in the Blackboard, it will, I think in most cases, fail to set it. I can't quite recall at the moment, but pretty sure that th that's what happens. Uh, and then we just make sure it's actually there, right? <laughs> I mean, we just fix our data and make sure it has all the things we need. Uh, you can set up Blackboards to have a parent Blackboard, which is sort of like an inheritance mm -hmm. kind of thing. It says, like, I want all those properties, and then I'll add my own. So if you have something that's basic to all of your AI, you could put that in one Blackboard and then have your AI-specific Blackboards uh, use that as a parent, and then that's kind of one way. derive from that, yeah. Yeah, that's one way to guarantee that, that it's, to sort of guarantee that it's there. Um, I didn't have a chance to look. He mentioned some crash. Uh, I didn't have a chance to look at that. I'm I sorry. If, if you ever get any crashes, please go to the Answer Hub so I can assign one of my technicians to look into it. The forums, it's not so easy for us to assign someone to guarantee a result. 
So yeah. if, if, if he's on there and he's got a crash, I would definitely like to see that reported. Yeah. So. Um, cool. Uh, <laughs> I think right. that's about about it. Yeah, uh, it looks like we're uh, about here. out of time. But, um, you know, uh, sorry, I didn't have time for chat. Yeah, sorry, guys. Normally we have a bit more time, but due to the previous <laughs> snowpocalypse, as we are calling it in North Carolina, um, that we have all survived, luckily. Uh, we've got a little bit short on time here, so we're going to van moose, but in 30 minutes we're going to have Chance Ivy and Alan Noon showing off the new multiplayer uh, shooter game, and it's available on the launcher in the Learn tab right now. Go on ahead and download it and get ready. It's going to be exciting. All right, guys, we'll see you uh, next time. Good luck. Thanks. <laughs>